Welcome to the History of North America. I'm Mark Vinette. In a recent episode, we raised the issue of cannibalism during the 1609-1610 starving time at Jamestown Colony. Let's take a deeper look, alongside the BBC, at the archaeology behind this startling revelation and also delve into the science of forensic genetics using Jamestown DNA. What else is going on in digging up old bones and trying to get DNA out of them? Okay, so I actually have a bit of a plea for this one. So I have been involved in the Sir George Yardley case. So this is Jamestown, Virginia, the first permanent English settlement in the U.S. And Sir George Yardley presided over the first representative government in what was going to become the United States of America, so the Virginia General Assembly, and this was in 1619. We think that we have found his grave. When we came down on it, we had a skeleton and a few teeth, and the skull was missing. The archaeologists realized that actually they'd excavated a grave which was above his one that kind of cut into it a little bit previously, the previous year. And inside that grave was a full sort of skelly and two extra skulls. And so I tested one of the skulls that they thought came back as male and the tooth, and they don't match one another. So now, I am now testing the other skull, which had originally, the osteologist had said this is probably female. Now another osteologist had a look at it and gone, no, actually, I'd say this is male. So I now have the petrous bone, which is a particular bone that you find in the skull that's very good for endogenous DNA content, so content DNA from the actual person in terms of looking at ancient DNA. And my next thing is to test to see whether or not that matches the teeth, which we assume is the rest of the skeleton. But what we are missing and what I need for this case is a reference sample. So a living individual who we know is a relative of Sir George Yardley. So now, presumably, you're looking for descendants Ideally, of Ideally, yes. Yardley. So his, um, Sir George Yardley's mother was Rhoda Marston. She seems to have been a single child. And her mum also seems to have been a single child. Ideally, we would like them to have sisters who had daughters, who had daughters, who had daughters, down through the generations so we can find the mitochondrial DNA line, because that just travels through the female line. But we're also looking for male line relatives. So apparently Sir George... Well, he had numerous, many children, numerous descendants, and many of them have been emailing me and saying, I'm related to Sir George Yardley and I'm descended. But we need that kind of all-male link to follow the Y chromosome, because that's how the Y chromosome travels down through the generations, or mitochondrial DNA for that all-female link, because the rest of our DNA is this complete mishmash of that of our ancestors. I need people related in those two different ways. Now, Sir George Yardley apparently had brothers, and his dad had brothers. So we're looking for male line relatives as well. It doesn't have to be Yardley. So we know there's spelling variants in the family, like Erdley, so without the Y at the beginning. So if anybody out there knows that they are part of Sir George Yardley's family and a male line relative, please do get in touch. They should be in this country because Sir George Yardley moved from England, from London, over to Jamestown, Virginia, where he eventually died, as we, as we know from the skeleton. So we're looking for relatives. <laughs> OK, so if you're a Yardley or an Erdley, or, and, and it's London-based, is it? But well, maybe all over the country? Uh, I have had someone who has emailed me with a, with a tree, and he thinks that the Erdley family, a uh, one branch of it might have ended up down in Portsmouth. Okay. Yeah. Proper detective work. Proper using genealogical genetics detective and work. Old bones there. Yeah. Love it. <laughs> After many years of unsuccessful North American settlements, the English founded the colony of Jamestown in Virginia. The original Jamestown colonists had never intended to grow all of their food. Their plans depended upon trade with the local natives to supply them with food between the arrivals of periodic supply ships from England. Lack of access to fresh water and a severe drought crippled the limited agricultural production of the Virginia colonists. A fleet from England, damaged by a hurricane, arrived months behind schedule with new colonists but without adequate food supplies. Combined with the lack of trade with the Native Americans and the failure of supply ships, the colony found itself with far too little food for the upcoming winter. An archaeological dig at Jamestown, Virginia, unearthed the remains of a teenage girl whose skull had been butchered, confirmation that early settlers resorted to cannibalism to stave off hunger during the winter of 1609-1610. The identity of this girl remains a mystery, but her skull has answered a gruesome question that has baffled scientists for centuries. These cut marks are the first tangible evidence that the early British settlers in North America 
resorted to cannibalism. What does the damage to the skull tell us? Well, the skull was fractured open by chopping. Right here is a puncture that was used to pry off the left side of the head. There are dozens of cuts on the face and the throat area to remove the tissues. The clear intent was to remove these facial tissues and the brain for consumption. The girl's remains were uncovered last year at the site of a fort near the historic Jamestown settlement in Virginia. Archaeologists found her skull and shin bone dumped in a rubbish pit inside a cellar. I walked in and saw the cut marks. And then it was a chill. It was a chilling experience. I wouldn't say, you know, it's not like a ha-ha. It was a, oh, really? You know, this is grim, but it's significant. The winter of 1609 is known as the starving time in colonial history. Instead of finding a new Eden, the settlers were faced with famine and took refuge in the old James Fort. Within the fort, they lost 80% of the people that were there. And so within that, they consumed all of the animals, the horses, the dogs, the cats, rats, anything they could get their hands on, and then clearly resorted ultimately to humans. Scientists don't know how the 14-year-old died, but they do know what she looked like. A digital reconstruction of her skull enabled this three-dimensional model to be printed. And it's now almost certain that this girl was not the only victim of cannibalism. Eyewitness accounts allude to others, and there were simply too many survivors who could not have lived without resorting to human flesh. <laughs> I'm behind the scenes at the Smithsonian's Natural History Museum, where I have with me the first scientific evidence that cannibalism happened at the first settlement in Jamestown, Virginia. With me is Dr. Doug Owsley, who is the forensic anthropologist here who examined these bones. Doug, what do we have? We have the partial skull of a girl that's 14 years of age. With this, we have multiple chops to the forehead. These are tentative chops. Don't do a lot of damage. On the back, we have deeper chops that actually split the skull open. We also have a puncture made with probably a single-bladed knife that is used to pry open this side of the skull. Along with that, we have numerous cuts to the facial tissues and also to the jaw, both on the outside and on the inside, used to remove the pharynx and tongue. Why would anyone want to dismember the face, though? Because there isn't much meat on that. Well, in 17th century recipes, for one thing, the brain is included in food. Certainly not human, but it is very common in animal remains. With regard to the facial tissues, the same is true. These are desperate people, and they're, they're very short of food. Now, we don't know who this girl was, but do the cuts tell you anything about who may have carried out this dismemberment? Well, for one thing, we can identify the kinds of tools that were used in making these chops and cuts. We can also determine where the position of the person was that was actually striking us. The girl is clearly dead. You would not be able to hit so many times without movement. So there's a lot we can tell. In this, I see hesitancy. I see someone that just is not skilled in the kitchen arts in butchering. It's very much trial and experimentation. There has been a lot of debate about whether cannibalism did take place during this time. Is this conclusive proof? When you put it within the context of the archaeological record and also the historic sources that exist, absolutely. It's very compelling evidence. Dr. Doug Owsley, thank you very much indeed. And there we have it, the first proof of dark deeds at Jamestown. I'm Mark Vinette, and I hope you're enjoying the ride.